Welcome to the second video in our series on upwind mainsail trim, presented by Salesing.com. Today's topic is camber, which is part two of the unit on shaping your sails. In this series, we're presenting a comprehensive review of basic and advanced mainsail trim concepts. We want the series to be useful and understandable for all levels of sailors. Our strategy is to start with small bites and build them into a complete picture of sail trim. We'll use a visual approach and give you questions to think about during the presentations. We'll stay practical, using theory only as needed. People learn in different ways. If you'd like to learn by reading, you can find an on outline version of each video on our website at salesing.com. The series is divided into five units with several parts per unit. In this video, we're covering part two of the four aspects of mainsail shape. For each topic, we'll discuss the things you should be aware of, like why it's important, how to control it, and indications and cues to look for. We'll also start building the bigger picture by addressing interactions, how the various aspects of sail shape affect each other and respond to changes in the wind. Today's topic is camber. Camber measures the fullness or depth of the sail. Specifically, camber refers to the distance from the cord line of the sail to the point of maximum depth, right here. Percent camber is the ratio between the camber and the cord length expressed as a percentage. Here are two examples. On the left is a relatively flat sail. We used online sail measuring software to determine that this sail has 9.7% camber at its mid height. On the right is a relatively full sail. Its camber is 16.5% at mid height. Note that each sail's camber might be different at different heights. You can measure your own sales camber by taking a picture and using one of several available software tools. There's a link in the description for this video. A sales camber is important because along with angle of attack, camber has the most effect on a sales performance. If you understand the basics of lift and drag, you'll know that a fuller sail creates more lift and more drag than a flatter sail. This is because the fuller sail deflects the moving air more than a flatter sail. Here's a flat sail with arrows representing the lift and drag produced. If we make the sail fuller, that is, give it more camber, we increase both the lift and the drag. For more on why this occurs, see our video on lift and drag. So, more camber means more lift, but more camber is not always better. Just like we saw in the angle of attack video, it's the combination of lift and drag that matters. Let's take a minute to see how this plays out. Imagine you are sailing upwind and you have plenty of power or lift to keep the boat moving fast. Assume your sail is relatively full with lots of camber. Let's use this drawing to represent the situation. Let's see what happens if you were to flatten the sail to reduce drag. With the fuller sail, the blue arrow represents the total force on the sail due to lift and drag. If we flatten the sail, the lift, drag, and total force all decrease. Notice how the total force, however, points more forward and less to the side with the flatter sail. This turns out to be really important. Let's see what effect this small change has on the boat's performance. The total force from the sail gets transmitted to the boat. Here's the total force from the fuller sail. Here the force is transmitted to the boat. Think about this total force in terms of two parts, a forward force propelling the boat forward and a side force healing the boat and pushing it to leeward. Let's compare this to the total force from the flat sail. Remember, the flat sail's total force was smaller, 
but it pointed more forward. If we break this into two parts, we see that the forward force is greater and the side force is less for the flatter sail. So reducing drag gives you more forward force and less side force. This means more speed with less hiking. We'll talk more about this shortly. In very light air, if a sail is too full, the air can't follow the shape of the leeward side of the sail and separates, stalling the sail. The reason has to do with laminar flow versus turbulent flow, turbulent flow and their ability to remain attached. Also, a flatter sail inherently points better than a fuller sail. We'll explain this in our next sail trim video. Even though there are a lot of differences between airplanes and sailboats, it's helpful to realize that airplanes couldn't fly very efficiently without being able to manage the camber in their wings. Takeoff, cruising, and landing each need different wing shapes. For takeoff, we want the plane to reach a high speed, enough to produce a lot of lift. The pilots maximize lift by extending the wing's flaps, both ahead and behind the wing, to give it more surface area. The extra surface area produces some more drag, but the airplane's engines e easily overcome this drag. Note that sailboats don't have engines to counteract drag. Once the plane is at cruising altitude, we want to throttle back the engines to save fuel. The pilots retract the flaps, leaving a smaller wing that is relatively flat. This reduces drag and the airplane maintains speed despite the reduced engine power. For landing, we want to fly as slowly as we can while still maintaining enough lift to keep the plane from descending too fast. The pilots extend and lower the flaps, producing a high lift, high drag wing. If you've paid attention while flying, you can feel the plane slow down when the flaps are lowered. Let's apply these concepts to understand how to maximize upwind performance. Here's a graph showing upwind performance against wind speed for a fictional sailboat. The bottom axis of the graph is wind speed. The left axis is the velocity made good to windward, or VMG. If you're not familiar with VMG, see our video or post on that topic. The graph compares a fuller sail, 12% camber, which is the blue line, to a flatter sail with 7% camber, which is the orange line. The numbers are made up, but are meant to illustrate the concepts. Let's look at four regions of the graph. The regions are based on wind speed and will vary for different boats and different crew, crew weights. In very light air, the fuller sail may have trouble retaining attached flow, and so the flatter sail may perform better. A lot depends on the camber in the upper sail and how, and how much the flow separation is caused by the mast. We'll talk more about these concepts in future videos. In the next region, you are seeking more power, either to accelerate your boat or to get it up to its maximum speed. Here, the fuller sail performs better. In the third region, we'll call it up to speed, your boat is near its maximum speed based on the hull shape and length. In this region, both sails are providing adequate lift, and you can experiment with flattening your sail to see if reduced drag gives you just a little better upwind performance. In the last region, you are overpowered, hiking to the fullest and still not able to hold the boat down. You have to depower the sail. In this region, the flatter sail has the advantage. If you have a full sail and can flatten it enough to match the flat sail, you'll be okay. But if you have to spill power by luffing the sail, the drag increases significantly, and the flatter sail will perform better. Finally, if waves are present, this graph changes. With significant waves, you need more power to maintain boat speed. Now, let's talk briefly about how camber is built into sails. 
first the sail maker cuts the luff and foot of the sail in a curve. When the boom and mast are straight, the extra material leaves a pocket in the sail. These pockets can be flattened by bending the mast or the boom. Next, the sail maker curves the edges of the panel. This picture is exaggerated to show these curves. When sewn together, the extra material forms pockets along the seams. These pockets are less responsive to flattening than the luff curving. The sail designer determines how much curvature is desired for the luff, foot, and each of the seams to optimize the sail shape and its response to the sail controls. Now let's talk about the ways to control camber. For this discussion, we're using a fairly simple fractional rig with no jib. The mast has one set of stays with swept spreaders. This boat's camber controls include the main sheet, vang, and outhaul. We'll start with the main sheet. On a boat like this, tensioning the main sheet has several effects. First, it pulls down on the middle or end of the boom, depending on the location of the blocks on the boom. This puts tension on the leech of the sail as shown by these red arrows. Tensioning the leech of the sail makes the top of the sail hook to windward, which increases the depth of the sail. This is especially noticeable in the upper portion of the sail and results in powering up the top of the sail. If the mast is flexible, then pulling the main sheet also bends the mast, especially in the top portion. This flattens the middle and upper portion of the sail. These two effects counter each other. The net effect depends on how much the mast bends and also on the sail design. Pulling on the main sheet also bends the boom on most boats. To the extent that the boom bends, this pulls out some of the foot curve and flattens the sail. This is normally a minor effect. Next is the boom vang. On most boats, the vang forms a triangle between the mast and the boom. Tensioning the vang pulls the boom forward and down. This pushes the lower mast forward, which flattens the lower portion of the sail by pulling out the luff curve. This depowers the sail. It also pulls the end of the boom down, although not as much as the main sheet does. This may actually power up the top of the sail again by tensioning the leech. However, since the vang pulls only on the front of the boom, easing the main sheet will let the end of the boom float up and down, even with a tight vang. This is helpful in responding to gusts because the boom will rise and let the upper sail flatten out. The vang also bends the boom and can help flatten the lower portion of the sail. Finally, if the boom is out toward the corner of the boat, a tight vang will also push the lower mast to windward, this way. This also helps flatten the lower part of the sail. More on this in future videos. Finally, let's talk about the outhaul. As you might expect, the outhaul adjusts the camber in the lower portion of the sail. A tighter outhaul flattens the sail down low. Camber in the lower part of the sail has benefits and limitations. First, the lower portion of the sail is large and has the potential to create lots of lift. Also, powering up the bottom of the sail doesn't contribute as much healing force as powering up the top of the sail does. The limitation is that power in the bottom of the sail tends to leak under the bottom of the boom as the air tries to take a shortcut to the lower side, lower pressure side of the sail. 
You can sometimes see this if you put telltales very low on the sail. The leeward side telltales may lift due to this upwash. This limits the amount of power available from the bottom of the sail. Now let's talk about the indications and cues, things you can look at to help manage camber. First are draft stripes. As you can see in the picture, these stripes make it easy to see the curvature in the sail. Glancing at them occasionally might cue you to make an adjustment. Tape to add draft stripes is available from all the sailmaker's supply houses. Next is overbend wrinkles. Greg Fisher is a big proponent of using these to tell you when you have the right camber. The boats indicated in the picture all have slight overbend wrinkles. They extend from the lower mast part way toward the end of the boom. Slight overbend wrinkles indicate that the mast bend matches the luff curve of the sail. If you are up to speed, this is good because you are matching the sailmaker's design for the sail. If you bend the mast further, the wrinkles will get more pronounced. Bending the mast too far has limitations. In general, you are distorting the design shape. You will not be able to flatten the camber built into the sail by the curved seams. This extra bend may still be somewhat effective, but you should consider other ways of depowering, such as using the traveler. Finally, your leech telltales indicate the airflow over the aft portion of the sail. This tells you a lot about camber. By the way, it's nice to have telltales on the end of each batten of your sail, so you can understand how all parts of the sail are performing. If the leech tails are always flowing in light to medium air, you don't have enough camber in the aft portion of the sail and are underpowered. A properly trimmed sail will stall periodically in the aft portion as the lower pressure air on the leeward side feels a pulse of high pressure air sneaking around the leech from the windward side. If the leech tails are never flowing, you either have too much camber in the aft portion of the sail or there's just not enough wind to m maintain attached flow. Use your main sheet and perhaps your vang to correct issues in the upper leech. The telltales should be flowing about 50% of the time. Use your outhaul to correct issues in the lower part of the sail. You may find that you can relax the outhaul for more power and still keep the leech telltales flowing half the time. Of course, if you get overpowered, tighten the outhaul. Finally, let's talk about the interactions and challenges with camber. The biggest issue for many boats is the upper portion of the mainsail. We'll briefly discuss these and cover more about them later in this sail trim series. The upper mainsail camber needs the most attention because it's challenged the most by changes in the wind. In light air, there is usually more wind near the top of the mast, so you want to power up the top of the main without stalling it. In heavy air, you want to reduce healing force, so you want to depower the top of the main without creating a lot of drag by luffing. In rapid changes, like gusts and waves, you want to power up and depower without trim inputs. That would be the ideal situation, but you also can learn how to make quick adjustments to deal with some of these rapid changes. The challenge is that control of the upper main is indirect. Unless your boat has an adjustable backstay, there's no one control for upper mainsail camber. Control depends on many factors. It depends on the controls that you have available, like the main sheet and the vang. It depends on the mast flexibility and rig tuning and whether you have stays for upper and lower mast bend. And it also depends on the sail design. Given these challenges, the best advice we can give you is to study your mainsail to understand how it behaves. I hope you took away at least a few pointers from this discussion. We've covered the following key points. Camber and percent camber are measurements of sail depth or fullness. 
Fuller sails provide more lift or power, but also more drag. Drag can easily slow a boat down. You have to manage camber to be fast in all conditions. In light air, you want more camber, especially in the top of the sail, but you also need to avoid stalling. When underpowered or accelerating, you want more camber. When you're at full speed, you can reduce the camber in the sails. And when you're overpowered, you need to aggressively reduce camber. And if possible, try, avoid, try to avoid spilling power by luffing the sail. Thanks for watching. Feel free to leave a comment. If you like our content, please subscribe. Also, visit our web website at salesing.com for more articles and our unique salesing products.